think the other thing you have to be alert to, especially as a private investigator, but to some degree as an attorney, <clears throat> if you have somebody who has criminal intent and they want you to gain some information for them. Um, I've had that happen a couple times. Um, I had a client in San Francisco who um, claimed he was this big heavy duty investor um, from Israel. Um, he donated tons of money to all the campaigns, DA, mayor, governor, and um, was really well known on the uh, San Francisco social scene. He's now serving 31 years in prison for massive frauds against various different high net worth people. Just last week, I got an email um, from a, a fellow, his name was uh, Martin Muller, and he emailed me from London and said that he had wired $2 million to an escrow agency in LA, <clears throat> and the realtor had disappeared, and his $2 million was not in the escrow account that he was supposedly emailing the money to, and asked me if he could engage me. So I sent him a retention letter, and he emails me back uh, basically um, a snapshot on his computer of his bank account at HSBC showing he had funds, and he had a, a telephone number, a London telephone number. So I started to research the realtor, and the realtor had been pulled off the website. The website was a website for one of the probably premier real estate companies here in this Beverly Hills area. <clears throat> well, what happened was this guy was a serial stalker and a nut job. And he had been looking on the internet. He saw a house for sale. He engaged her in conversation. He then made up a lot of things. He ended up threatening to kill her, threatened to kidnap her children. She had to leave the firm etc. And he had hired several private investigators before me who actually went out and tried to talk to her, locate her, go to her business place and everything. <clears throat> and uh, I, I asked him to show me a copy of the wire transfer for the two million because I figured if I saw the wire transfer for two million and I saw that it went into a legitimate escrow account that something was the matter with this guy. And he had some other issues too when I talked to him. And as it turns out, LAPD actually had several warrants against him for threats, stalking, criminal threats, and uh, they actually were going to extradite him from the UK. So you have to be very careful when you have clients come to you and they give you like a little bit of a squirrely thing. And But it seems reasonable because you, you're in LA, so there's a lot of squirrely <laughs> things you know, that go on here. And we've all dealt with them, and it's just life here. Uh, and so I think you have to be careful on that end, too. Okay, so before we start going into what a, an investigator can or cannot do in the scope of I mean, can you record, can you photograph, that type of stuff, I want to talk briefly about giving a, a few tips about uh, getting into a contractual relationship with an expert who's going to do some investigation for you and things that maybe we should be mindful of in entering into those contracts. Anybody want to comment on that at all? Oh, I was just going to say, I have my clients pay my trust account for these experts, and my firm retains the experts rather than the client retaining the expert directly, because I believe there's then a litigation privilege and a work product privilege. It protects the client, protects my firm. And uh, speaking to that, Dimitri, um, we're very particular at my firm in that we want to be retained by the attorney for just that purpose. Um, and then additionally, we have up there agent for attorney. Well, um, I would say in a criminal matter, maybe that's how you could describe some of the work we might do for that particular matter. But then we deal with a lot of civil litigation as well also. So with that being said, we end up being retained as, for argument's sake, experts or consulting experts. A lot of times we get thrown off of a case you know, in terms of being the eventual uh, testifying experts, simply because we know too much. And then they have to bring in downstream experts like us again, relearn the case so they can testify and not listen to everything that we heard 
that could jaunt us the case. If, if I have a very simple matter and a company calls and we're doing a due diligence on a company that's going to be acquired, a background investigation on somebody uh, for one of our, say, a commercial client or something, we just kind of do those because those are kind of pro forma and we're not going to have any issues or problems with that. But if it has anything to do with a complex matter, a financial matter, um, or something that's either in court or going to be going to court, then what I like to have is a retention letter, and then we do a statement of work. And what we'll do is we'll phase the work in so that we'll say, OK, we'll do phase one. It'll cost x amount of dollars. And then at that point, we'll review everything and decide whether you want to go to phase two, phase three. That way, you keep control of the client's budget, and you don't exceed anybody's expectations. And one of the other things we want to point out to you as we're going into the examples of what PIs can or cannot do is that don't assume because that person as an investigator has been doing it forever and ever, they know the rules as to what can or cannot be done by an investigator. Do not, as an attorney, assume they know what the law is. I cannot stress that more that an investigator may not know. And so you as an attorney have an obligation to learn what they can or cannot do. Now, we do have some, uh, some lists of things that, of course, we typically use a, a personal investigator for. Uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time going through these. You can look at the list later. We can uh, maybe briefly talk about um, what they cannot do. Can I make one comment, Brian? Sure. Um, as you're probably all aware, and Tom is more than aware, there is a state board for PIs in California. That's real easy to find it on the, you know, California government website, and you can look up to see if a PI is still licensed, if there's any things in the past that you might be concerned about. So use that to your advantage if you're hiring a PI. Don't you agree, Tom? Yes. <clears throat> but I think if you're going to hire a PI and you've never worked with that PI before, and probably the most important thing is to let that person know your expectations. And the other thing is, uh, I've done probably a majority of my cases I've done for attorneys where I don't know who the ultimate client is. So I will get a phone call from an attorney in New York on a matter, and it's what I consider to be a fairly significant matter. I don't know who the client is and, and what's happening. I just know that the expectation is this is what they, the information they need for me to go out and find out. So you have to keep it really clear. Okay, so one of the things you can't do as a, a personal investigator is violate, ask them to violate the law, such as trespassing, uh, harassing, uh, bribing witnesses, just typical things that you would think of, but I just want to bring it to your attention that there are limits as to what a a PI can do. And, and I've seen indictments for obviously hacking into a computer and try to get data that's privileged. Um, you can hire people in India to help you get passwords. I've seen somebody indicted for that. And then on the slide right before, uh, the wiretapping, obviously Anthony Pelicano's case was, was a big case here in Los Angeles and a bunch of people were indicted for that. So you just have to be really careful to, you know, as much as you want to win, You've got to follow the law. You don't want to be sued yourself or be subject to an indictment. It's not worth it. 